Hi there, welcome to Candor Office Hours. Today we're going to talk about resumes and more specifically what top tech companies look for and how to put together a resume that works. We have a extra packed hour ahead of us and I'm super excited to talk to you about this topic because it's really, really important, especially now that the job market has gotten so much tougher. Before we start, make sure that you are in a comfy spot. Uh, we are going to take the full hour today to go through all of the material. Make sure you have something to write with, you have your coffee or your tea, whatever you're taking in the morning, and you are ready to go. Uh, if you can hear me, please take a moment to say hi to me on chat on the side, and that's how I know that my microphone's working and we can go ahead and get started. Awesome. I'm seeing a lot of you are saying hi and chat has been turned on to private to make sure our connection is super strong. So it's really great to see so many of you here. Awesome, let's go ahead and start. A little bit about Candor and why we know about this. Candor helps with salary negotiation for high skill professionals, especially folks in tech. The way that it works is there's no risk to try it out. You don't pay us anything unless we increase your offer. So it's absolutely free to try, and we'd love to give it a shot with you if you get an offer throughout this process, especially as a result of attending some of the office hours we'll be doing together. We really value discretion, and we work under NDA with our clients, and we've helped hundreds of people. Uh, in tech in all sorts of roles across engineering, data science, product management, design, strategy, ops, in all sorts of levels from individual contributor all the way to C-level executive. So feel free to reach out if you have questions about your uh, negotiation, if you have an offer you're already considering, and the team can help you out. Most of our clients get 50,000 or more on their offer, and that's being super, super conservative. A lot of times folks get more than that, uh, double, triple, quadruple, and even more, because we work with folks that are super senior too, and those raises tend to be huge. And we work with folks all over the place, whether it's Google, Airbnb, Stripe, Facebook, or smaller companies, uh, even startups that just have a few people that are starting to hire. Maybe you're the first engineer there. We could definitely help you out and take a look at your offer. A little bit about resumes. Today we're going to concentrate on this topic and I'm warning you, some of the advice that I'm giving you may come off as a bit controversial. In fact, it may directly contradict some of the things that you have heard before and that's by design. There's a reason why nobody's getting back to you when you're applying and it's because your resume is likely not updated for 2020. A lot of the very old resume conventions out there could be actively harmful for you. And we're going to dispel a lot of myths today. Also, one of the things that's really important to understand is the job climate has really changed. A great resume is not enough to land you a job. It's a great start, but it's definitely not enough. So as we talk about your resume, please keep in mind that this is part of a series of things you need to do and work on in order to land a job in tech that you really, really love. And here's a few things that you want to consider. You certainly want a polished resume, and we're going to take care of that today together. We'll go through all sorts of things that you want to do, things you want to consider, things that are important. But you also want to work on referrals. Unfortunately, a lot of the jobs out there to be quite frank with you, they're fake. They're not existing jobs that companies are hiring for. There's a ton of reasons for that. It could be that the uh, internal candidate got the job. It could be that it never got updated because of COVID. It could be that it's just a much older position. But TLDR, chances are if you're applying for something online, you're not even applying for a real job, let alone looking for a callback. So you really want to lean in on those referrals. And we have a ton of resources on how you can do that. We even have a free course on our YouTube channel. If you look up Candor on YouTube, uh, that takes you through everything you need to do to get referred into big tech companies. A strong intro blurb is really important and knowing how to position yourself is crucial. Uh, and we have a workshop on positioning and kind of building your brand, understanding how to talk about yourself confidently and self-advocate. But today it's all about your resume. So let's buckle up and go for the four main pillars of building a strong, strong resume. Clarity, brevity, context, and layout. And they're in the right order. You really want to do this systematically. And one thing that I will really ask you for today is suspend this belief 
And let's do this from scratch. Imagine that you don't have a resume right now and that you and I are building this together collaboratively. And we're going to go through each of the steps until we're at the end. And at the end, it will look like a resume. And I want you to kind of confirm what you've put together and compare it to the original resume you had and see how different they are. Um, so best thing you could do is try to do this from scratch with me today. All right, so let's talk about clarity. Your resume is intended to be a communication tool. And before we talk about any of your accomplishments in your resume, people need to have the right context. I mean, if someone asks you what you do, you wouldn't tell them, I increase productivity by 100%. You would first tell them what your actual job is, and then maybe you would mention the accomplishment. Same thing for your resume. You want to start for every single job you're listing on there with a one sentence, no frills description of what you did at your last three jobs. So here's an example that you could use from a product manager at Facebook. Developed a hardware video product targeting users in international markets with high data costs. Let's talk about why this is a really good example. One of the key things of this is first, we understand what this person did. It's very clear what their job was. There's no embellishments here. There's no adjectives, there's no percentages, there's no 5X or 6X. It's just very plain. This is very important to do. Second, it's very clear what this person's scope of their job was. So they talked about the size of the market they were working in, the type of product, the size of product they were working on as well. And as you're going to learn if you attend some of these office hours at Candor, scope is incredibly important and scope plays a massive, and I mean massive role, in how much you are compensated, what jobs you're offered, and how you are leveled. So anything I have to tell you today past this one slide, if you don't get this right, you are going to fail your resume. And if you're doing this right, it's going to take a few tries. Uh, you're going to write it down, show it to a friend. Uh, show it to people in our closed LinkedIn group. You can join the Candor LinkedIn group to get help and feedback. Um, and it's going to feel like, oh my God, this one sentence, why is it taking me so long? That's normal. Um, make sure that you spend the time that you need to spend to really make it crisp, clear, and very, very illustrative of the level of your effort and the scope of your job. Next, we're going to work on your bullet points. And your bullet points are really propping up your accomplishments in this one thing that you did at your job. And while a lot of us do a ton of different things and wear a lot of different hats, the bullet points are there to really reinforce what you did in your main function, not to talk about the nine extra things you did that you were not required to do at your job. So we need to be really disciplined here. As we write these out for each job, we're going to focus on areas that are really in these three buckets, identifying a win, rallying the team, or iterating and optimizing. Anything that doesn't fit here should not make it to your resume. And this is really important because these three things are really what a hiring manager or a recruiter are looking for. They're looking to understand what specifically you do and how specifically you excel at it. They're not looking at the nine different things you do that are not your chief responsibility. So you really want to talk about uh, times when you found something that wasn't obvious in identifying a win, times when you really uh, were able to lead the team to success, maybe bring in more revenue or save money for the organization or save resources of uh, ever kinds. When you talk about rallying the team, you really need to talk about a time when you were a leader, either in resolving conflict, bringing people together, leading a project, uh, doing cross-functional work. When you're talking about iterating and optimizing, here we're talking about metrics that you were able to influence, whether uh, you brought in efficiencies, found clever ways to implement things, or were able to accomplish things with limited resources. What I don't want you to do is I don't want you to just have these bullet points floating with different percentages and a ton of adjectives that nobody is going to understand or relate to without context. So here's an example here of bad implementation. Um, you really want to remember that people haven't worked with you at your job. Even if they've been a PM, they haven't been a PM at your company and your team. And so increasing something by 200% or 4x doesn't really mean a lot to people. Try to quantify things in units that are relatable to people outside of your immediate orbit. 
Next, what we want to do is we want to take this and do a test. We want to take a friend or a colleague, ideally somebody who doesn't work with you every single day, maybe somebody cross-functional in another department, and we need their help. Uh, we're going to ask them a couple of questions. We're going to show them your bullet points and your job descriptions you've written so far. And we're going to ask them to answer these two questions. One, uh, can you describe what I do and what makes me good at it? And two, what do you feel is my greatest accomplishment after reading this? And what you're really looking for is someone who crisply, confidently answers that. If you see a bit of a confused look, if you hear, hmm, that means you haven't really nailed it yet. And we're going back to the drawing board, redoing the descriptions, redoing the bullet points until something clicks. This is crucial. This is not to just kind of have you waste time. There's a very specific reason why I'm having you do this. And it's because recruiters who are the folks who are looking to hire you, uh, they're typically not people who have a technical background. They're people people. So you need to make it very crisp and easy for them to pattern match your experience with the role that they're recruiting for. If you overly embellish, if you get too crazy on the metrics, if you get too technical, what you're going to accomplish in the end is you're going to make it completely illegible for a recruiter. Remember that you're communicating to the recruiter first. They're your guide inside of the organization. Everybody you will meet later is someone the recruiter will introduce you to. And you want to write your resume at a level that's really, really speaking to the recruiter, not speaking to an engineering manager, not speaking to a data science director, speaking to the recruiter who is going to help you navigate the process. Moving on, I really want to talk about brevity because your resume is not a cover letter. And honestly, I'm gonna say it again, your resume is not a cover letter. Don't try to make it one. And while we're on cover letters, let me tell you something that I don't hear said enough in tech. Cover letters are dead. There is not a recruiter that I have seen in like the last five years who has read a cover letter and works in tech. So rest easy, you don't need to write these anymore. In 2020, the cover letter is dead. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to take all that content and jam it in your resume. What we want is one page only. I mean that, no cheating, not double-sided, single-sided, one page only. And that applies even if you're senior, that applies even if it means you're going to edit a lot, it, and a lot of the stuff won't make it to your resume, that's okay. Even if your friend told you it's okay, it's not okay. <laughs> even if you have a lot of accomplishments, even if you're like an academic, a senior person, uh, even if it's just a few lines over on the second page, we really want it to fit on one page. And one page that a human can reasonably read. Don't make the font super, super tiny. So no cheating. This is really important. And it's not because like I woke up one day and said, all right, all resumes have to be one page. But it's because a resume is a tool for you to sell yourself. It's kind of your one sheet. And the most important thing in selling yourself is being able to crisply and clearly communicate how exactly you fit in to the job that a recruiter or a hiring manager is hiring for. And you cannot communicate things clearly by being you know, nine pages long. You want to communicate it crisply and clearly in one page. Brevity here equals a high degree of communication, a high communication skill. This is something that's crucial because if you have a resume that gives a poor impression of you, you might be perceived as a bad communicator, even if you're not a bad communicator overall. And in jobs that are very critical to an organization, so imagine you're a product manager and communication is one of the key things that you need to be able to do. If you can't even sell yourself and communicate about yourself, how am I going to trust you with a product that is worth $100 million to this company? I simply won't. I'll simply pass on you, and we don't want that. Yes, I know it's hard to be on one page, but I promise you, it's good to be on one page. Ideally, you're not listing more than four past jobs that are relevant to the position you're applying for. And you really want to lean into relevant. That means that sometimes you won't have all sequential relevant jobs, and that's okay. It's absolutely all right just to list the title of a previous job without putting in bullet points or a description if it's not relevant. 
but spending more time and more bullet points on jobs that really illustrate how you're a fit for the position. That's a trade-off that is absolutely worth it and absolutely okay to do. So don't be afraid of that. What is bad is if you list all jobs you have ever been at and some of them are relevant, others are not, and really what you're doing is causing confusion. And going back to basics here, our resumes are a communication tool and we just need to be clearly communicating how we fit, not trying to tell the history of our professional life. So it's about fit, not about history. Resumes are a tool what you're good at. So when you also talk about things like skills, when you talk about things like experiences you've had, when you highlight courses you've taken, we really want to talk about what you're good at, what contributes to your brand, what contributes to you being a good fit. So don't just think about the job description. Think about every other little bit that makes it to your resume and make sure all of it is pointing in the same direction. Sometimes this means some things won't make it to your resume, even if they're important to you. And that's okay. Sometimes it means that you might need to have multiple resumes for different functional roles you're applying for. That's okay too. What's not okay is to have one kind of massive resume that's chock full of every single thing you do and every single skill you have. We just need to be really targeted to the things that make us fit well. And since it's not a cover letter, and we've been very, very adamant about that, one thing we want to avoid is a section that's called a professional summary or sometimes called an objective section at the top of your resume. I see this a lot and it eats up a lot of precious real estate. If we need to stay on one page, then we have to be really frugal with that space. You really also want to avoid positioning yourself with an objectives or a professional summary if you already have relevant experience, it just serves to detract from the recruiter getting to the really important parts of your experience that uh, might put you as a good fit. If you have an untraditional background though, so for instance, maybe you worked in finance and you went to a data science boot camp and now you're applying for data analyst jobs at Facebook. In that case, it would be all right to put on objectives or a professional summary. So if you have an untraditional background, you're transitioning careers, this is a great tool for you to use. But for everyone else, don't you dare, guys. This is something we really need to stay away from. It's very dated and kind of old resume technique that needs to be put to rest and makes you look uh, very stodgy, eats up a lot of space, and ultimately brings no benefit to you. I'm gonna show you two examples. I'll show you what is really awesome to put as an objective, and I'll show you what is just like horrible um, for you to see a little bit of real life experience that recruiters get. All right, here's a bad example. Don't do this. And I'm going to explain to you specifically why this is bad, because I want you to understand the substance of it. So this kind of combines every single thing that's bad about the professional summary all at once. First, this is very, very long and dense. And even without me reading this, I feel just fatigue of needing to read this. And that's not the first impression anybody should have of your resume. So the first issue here is length. The second issue is inconsistent formatting. You see just visually before reading this, some things are bolded, other things are not. And when you format like this, instead of paying emphasis on the things you bolded, you just make it visually confusing for people and you make it unpleasant to look at. Next, when you actually start reading this, you'll see it's a combination between sentences and just words, just keywords. Um, going back to sentences again, and there's not really a through line. There's not really a purpose to this. It's not, uh, the sentences are not related to each other in any way. Uh, it's just very dense and unconnected in any way. And so when I actually spent the time to read this, what I came to the conclusion of is this person is an incredibly poor communicator. They might be an amazing professional otherwise. They might be the best whatever it is that they do. However, they are a very, very poor communicator. And their resume left me with a very bad impression. You definitely don't want to play uh, keyword bingo here in your professional summary. There's a lot of people who get very obsessed with ATS, and ATS is applicant tracking systems. So let me be perfectly clear here in saying, in candor, we don't advocate that you game ATS. 
because ATS is for people who put in job applications. And as I mentioned in the very, very beginning of this, uh, there's nobody who's going to be looking at your job applications because the chance of the job not even existing is extremely high. So instead of spending your time jamming your resume with keywords, what we want to do is spend time on your LinkedIn where you're more likely to be found and spend time making your resume legible to a human and not to a machine. So please, please, please avoid this at all costs. Here's the kind of opposite example. What does a good objective section look like? Something like this. It's kind of one sentence. It really clearly positions you to the role that you want to do and kind of explains any time that you might have had a transition or kind of inconsistencies in your background so people understand what the purpose of your job search is right now. And moving on to skills. This is another area of the resume that needs to uh, be refactored for 2020. And this is super, super important. We don't want you playing keyword bingo. Um, this is not a good place for you to be for multiple reasons. Uh, first, some of the skills that people put on there actually make them look bad and end in them not getting a job. Second, um, ATS, again, is not the optimal job search strategy anymore in 2020. Maybe it was in 2005. That's like more than a decade ago. So it's time to move on. And third, um, the way that you do skills is actually very important because if you do the skills section the right way, you'll get noticed for the right reasons and actually get brownie points with the manager or with the recruiter and have a higher chance on getting the job that you want. So we really need to work on this. And I'm going to walk you through the different types of skills that recruiters and hiring managers consider. And then for each section, I will tell you what are some things that you might want to know or kind of things you might want to really think through as you do this. All right, let's go. First, technical skills. Prioritize listing these at all costs. These are huge for your resume. Um, you only want to put out them on there if you're proficient though. So like if you put Python, you better be ready. I will be asking you questions about what libraries use. Um, it's really, really important to list technical skills here. So this could be things like uh, different languages that you code in. These could be um, specific frameworks you're familiar with. If you're a designer, it could be uh, applications you use. So for instance, if you use Figma or if you use Sketch or Illustrator, After Effects, these would be things that you would put here. Um, these are important because technical skills are a lot of times what recruiters will look for and also what they hire people for. And this something they pattern match for. So if I'm hiring a front end engineer that needs to know these like two free different languages or frameworks, I will look for those specific languages or frameworks as a recruiter in your resume. Um, applications are also important. So things like Jira, Tableau, uh, these are really good to put in, especially if you're coming from like a smaller company to a bigger company or you have an untraditional background. It just gives the company kind of an idea that you have some transferable skills, that you're familiar with kind of maybe working in a matrix org, things like that. Salesforce is great to put here. Um, these are really, really uh, wonderful skills to put on a resume. What we want to avoid is we want to avoid putting things that might be considered quote unquote basic. So don't put Google Docs, don't put Microsoft Office. Um, the only reason you should be putting Office on there is if you use Excel or Access for something more complex. So for instance, you uh, use Excel for financial modeling or your VBA dev. In those cases, definitely put it, but otherwise, it will really make you look bad instead of making you look good. So here, it's not about listing a thousand skills, it's about listing the ones you're best at uh, and being very confident in them. Soft skills are something that you should not, and I mean never, put in the skills section of your resume. And when I say never, I honestly mean it. If you have it on your resume, please do me a favor. If you do one thing for me today, please take them all off. Here's why. They actually make you look incredibly bad. Um, these soft skills should be listed in the job bullet points that we worked on earlier. So if you say that you're a good leader, you should demonstrate through your experience how you've led. If you say you're awesome at stakeholder engagement, you should demonstrate through your experience how you've led cross-functional work. Listing these things separately 
actually makes you look not credible. It doesn't like you make you look more credible. It actually makes you look, again, way less credible. And it's a shame because typically people mean well by putting these things on there. They're proud of these skills. They've honed these skills. But unfortunately, again, if you list them separately, it's just a total non-starter. These are also things that people won't trust you on. And I don't mean to say this in a bad way, but companies hire for hard skills. They look for hard skills and they interview uh, for soft skills. That's a really big reason why the interview exists. People want to meet you and figure out like, are you a good leader? Are you a good communicator? Are you awesome at stakeholder engagement? That's why the interview exists. So you're not doing yourself any favors by putting this on your resume. Really, really weave these into your bullet points and make yourself shine by showcasing real accomplishments and situations where you're really able to move the needle. Let's talk about red flags. These are very, very real red, sometimes kind of orange, but mostly red flags that you need to be aware of that honestly, no one really tells you about. So I'm just gonna tell you. Um, Various additional levels of certification, uh, Udemy, Coursera, these could be either really good or really bad. And let me tell you about when they're really good. When they're good is if you've taken a course that's really difficult, if you've taken maybe a mini degree on there, if you've uh, taken something challenging or something to help you position yourself if you're transitioning your career. In those cases, it could be great. But what is not great is if you've taken a class called Communication 101. What that's going to tell me if you put it on your resume is that you're a really poor communicator. Sure, you're trying, but you're a really poor communicator. Um, It's not really to your advantage to put every single course you have ever finished on your resume, especially if you're taking things out of personal interest. So you might be taking LinkedIn learning courses or other courses. When you're uh, kind of taking more basic or kind of elementary or not really advanced courses that don't showcase you as a competitive professional, you should not be putting this on your LinkedIn all on your resume. It's okay you're taking them. That's kind of a thing you do on your free time, but you're just devaluing yourself and by proxy devaluing your brand by putting things on there um, that do not show you in the right light. Again, I wanna be clear, Udemy and Coursera are awesome and there's courses on there that will make you look really competitive, but there's others that won't. So make sure that you really pick through what will make you shine, especially for your field, for your role, and uh, for the expertise that you're trying to acquire. Please don't list conferences or hackathons you've attended. Please, I beg of you, do not do this on your resume. Every time I see this on a resume, my heart dies a little bit on the inside. Um, This is a horrible thing to do. There's no such thing as a participation prize uh, in adult life. Just because you showed up somewhere, it just, you don't get an award for that. It doesn't show you as a person who is networking in the field. Uh, In fact, it it just shows you as someone who's credential seeking and and that's just not a caught look. So if you have that on there, again, another big thing to do today, just delete it. Competitions you participated in and didn't win, same thing. It's awesome that you participated, but you know, there's no such thing as a participation award uh, in like adult life. So Uh, This is something that you should not put on your resume. Might make a really awesome Medium post or blog post that you want to share on your LinkedIn, but it's not something your resume should highlight as an accomplishment. Side projects. Um, That could go either way. So side projects that are bad are things that detract from what you're trying to accomplish from what your resume. Side projects that are good are things that help you get closer to getting the job that you want. So I'll give you some examples. If you're a student um, and you put some projects that you did in school, that's amazing. That's really great to see. If you're transitioning careers, maybe you are uh, someone who is moving from engineering to design and you spend a lot of time uh, building a portfolio and because you don't have real industry experience, you've built a portfolio based on kind of self-assigned or volunteer projects. That's awesome. That's amazing to do. If you're an engineer who's becoming a data scientist and you want to showcase a portfolio of work, that's awesome. If you're someone who has a side business that has, uh, you know, real metrics. So for instance, you have a startup or something else that generates a significant amount of passive income. That's awesome. But don't list side projects outside of that. Anything else should not be on there uh, because it just detracts from your overall positioning and that is not where we want to be. 
Volunteer activities should not be taking up a significant portion of your resume. And in fact, nowadays, it's standard to put your volunteer activities on your LinkedIn and not on your resume. So if you have these on there, my advice to you is it is great to put a volunteer board on there if you're on the board of an organization. However, if you're not at that level of the organization and you're just volunteering some time or some of your effort or some of your skills, uh, if you're short on space on your resume, it's much better to showcase these things on LinkedIn. Uh, that's where nowadays folks uh, are really encouraged to put their uh, volunteer information. Let's talk about how to clean up your resume. This is going to be really, really important because one of the things that we all struggle with is context. And we've all gotten the advice of you should have a separate resume for every single job you apply for. And first of all, let me tell you, that's definitely not required. Uh, we don't need to have 16 resumes. Sometimes it helps to have a few or it helps to have a kind of change a few words in your resume, and I'll show you how. But you certainly should not be top to bottom rewriting your resume for every job you apply for unless you're applying for functionally different jobs. So if you're applying for product and program managers, then they're functionally different. You should have a resume for each. In all of our cases, you should have one resume where we're just tweaking a little bit here and there. And when it comes to applications, quality over quantity is extremely important to remember. And this day and age, applying for five jobs with strong referrals is much better than applying for 500 jobs for applications. In fact, you are definitely wasting time by filling in those applications. So I really, really urge you by spending more time on referrals and spending more time on tailoring your resume, making it look like a marketing document of you, which is what it is. So let's take a look at a few things we want to do. So first, we definitely want to make a short list of jobs you want. And when you look at the jobs you want, we're going to look at the job description. And we're going to pull anywhere between three and five keywords from the job description and add those to your resume and to your intro blurb. And we'll talk about your intro blurb in the referral workshop, which you're more than welcome to attend. It's uh, something that we also put on for free. And when I talk about why is it that we pull keywords, what kind of keywords do we pull, let me be very specific. I'm uh, going to be honest. I've stolen this example from an Amazon recruiter I greatly respect. And this is how she explained it to me. She said, you don't walk into a Starbucks and ask for a double espresso shot with uh, kind of half a cup of milk and froth. You ask for a latte or a frappuccino. And the only thing we're trying to accomplish by switching a few keywords in your resume is to show that you walk the walk, that you speak the language, that you can go in there and, you know, order that uh, that uh, frappe or latte that you want in the using the right language. That's really all it is. Uh, we're not talking about any kind of massive rewrite of your resume or anything top to bottom of your resume. If you're doing this, then you're likely applying for jobs that are way too different from each other. And it should definitely um, be a cause for concern for you. Like, why are you looking at things that are so functionally different? Anytime that you decrease your focus, you also decrease your chance of getting hired fast for something. So if you're applying for functionally different things, um, there's a, other strategies you might want to use to optimize your time. We definitely also want to keep our design simple. Um, so this is something really crucial that we don't talk about enough. And I'm going to wrap up on this topic because it is something that is really, really um, kind of important for us to all understand. When I say simple, I mean less is definitely more here. The product we're selling is you. And so categorically, this needs to be perfect. And one of the things closest to perfection is simplicity, because simplicity is actually dece deceitfully hard to achieve. Uh, I see people a lot paying companies, paying coaches, paying God knows who to design a resume for them. And at the end, they get something that's visually beautiful, however, has very low communication value. And we want your resume to have high communication value and also to be visually well put together. We're not looking here for a work of art. Nobody will judge you based on whether or not your resume is a Picasso or a Matisse. People will judge you whether or not it's a clear tool to communicate your background, how legible it is, 
And we really want people to spend time on the meaty, meaty parts that we spent so much time working on so far. So let's do this together. I'll give you some quick tips on how you can do this on your own. First, and this is both a quick tip and a really sneaky tip, uh, you can invest in a high quality font on your own. And there's some options here. You could do something free or something paid. I love Google Fonts. Uh, they're completely free to use. It's super simple to download on your computer. And you could use some of these that I love. Uh, I love GoTo and I love Playfair for people's names at the top of the resume for headers. They're both really beautiful and will make your name really pop. Uh, fonts come in multiple hefts, so there's thin or italic or bold. So you want to play around with it and make sure that your name really, really pops on the page uh, because your name's your brand. I'll use Leto when I use Google Fonts for a body font. It's like a really beautiful pared down font. It's really easily readable. And again, we're really optimizing for this being an awesome communication tool for you. So the more legible it is, the better. You don't wanna have like a really intense font because if you can't read it, then you kind of miss the whole point of your resume. Leto is amazing for that. I usually use it in Finn. And uh, that's all you need for the design part. It's just laying it out beautifully and using uh, fonts is a very quick hack for that. If you do want to pay some money, um, let me give you some guidelines. So first, usually the way that fonts are sold is um, you buy each heft separately. So if there's like a light, an italic, and a bold, usually each of these hefts is sold separately. And you can also buy it as a package where you have every single type of uh, font. My recommendation is to just buy them individually. Um, unless you're a designer and you really want to have these in your tool toolbox, um, I recommend just buying one heft. It's typically sufficient. And the two that I personally have purchased that I love are Avenir and Canellas. Avenir is something that I use interchangeably with Leto. It's a very legible font for the body of your resume, so for the job descriptions, for the bullet points. And Canellas is really, really beautifully spaced. It's very kind of visually impactful, and it does a great job when you put your name uh, and kind of headers in Canellas is really stunning. I use them both in light. Uh, you Both of them cost about 30 to 35 bucks to purchase depending on the site. Um, so it's not expensive at all. And certainly based on what I'm hearing out there, people are paying like hundreds of dollars to do their resume. 30 bucks is not a crazy investment compared to that. And uh, obviously you get to keep the font for life. Here's some other things you want to do. Um, you definitely want to resist the urge to use logos of any kind. This is a screenshot from an actual person's resume, and there's so many things wrong with it, I don't even know where to start. But I want to be objective here. If you're a designer and you are actually very highly skilled visually to uh, pull off a beautiful uh, resume that does have some logos, especially for your jobs, that's okay. But very few people have that level of design skill and it's also just not necessary. So my general advice is to avoid using logos, avoid using photos. Um, if you do use them, make sure that they are all grayscale. Um, make sure that they are also all the same resolution, the same size. Um, and I would very, very heavily advise against using these kind of certification logos. So this person used all the different things they were certified in, and the idea behind it was to give themselves credibility and lift. Um, but unfortunately, it just comes off as exactly the opposite. It looks unpolished, unfinished, and uh, actually detracts credibility and trustworthiness from them, which is unfortunate. You want to avoid flashy elements and you want to optimize for clarity. Uh, I have a pet peeve in life. Confession. Uh, if I see anybody's resume with these dots, I have a mild panic attack because this is one of the worst communication devices I have seen. And whoever started this trend, if you're watching this, I want to have a word with you <laughs> outside because this is just horrible. I mean, like, is this, what What the hell is even free machine learnings versus six machine learnings? Or am I supposed to read it the other way around? First of all, really important to remember is we are optimizing for 
clarity. I should be able to immediately know uh, what skills you have. And I should really concentrate on your accomplishments in your resume. I shouldn't be trying to figure out if it's four or five Excels or what's the difference between all these different arbitrary levels of Excel that don't exist in real life. Um, and also, we really want to be culturally sensitive. Uh, people come from different places, different cultures, and not in all cultures do we read left to right. In some cultures, we read right to left. Uh, and so my instinct um, was to look at this first as two Excels and then as four Excels, and then I just got exhausted. So please avoid these elements. I know that your intention is to have a beautiful resume that people uh, would spend time looking at, but unfortunately it accomplishes the opposite. You have a resume that people are confused by, which is not what we want. And let's wrap up by talking very tactically about what to do with the rest of your resume. So your name and your address block. Your name should be two to four times larger than any other text on your resume. And it, you need to use either a bolder font or a different font. You can use one of the fonts I suggested. You can certainly experiment on your own. There's a ton of beautiful options out there. Um, just definitely find something that's both polished and authentic to you. And I really recommend a custom font here um, because a lot of times if you use Times New Roman or Arial, uh, your resume just isn't, really doesn't stand out. You want to list a phone number and an email so people can reach you. Please, for the love of God, do not put your physical address, especially your street address, where somebody can come find out where you live. Um, nobody needs this. And there's nothing a company will need uh, your physical address for until they are ready to hire you, at which point it makes sense for them to have it. But in the application process, especially when your resume might be passed around for multiple people, it is not safe for you to list your home address on there. Um, definitely put in the city that you're from or the city where you want to be. Uh, I would really heavily advise against putting things like open for relocation or, or things like that. Uh, some people in this section would put whether or not you are authorized to work in the U.S. and that's fine to put if you'd like to. It's certainly not required to put. And you definitely want to put your LinkedIn um, because recruiters use and need that. You want to put your GitHub, maybe your Behance or your Dribbble but only add your uh, portfolio sites if you think they're adding value. So if all of your GitHub projects are in a different language or framework than what the job's hiring for, don't add it. You're actually shooting yourself in the foot. You're not helping yourself. Uh, likewise, if your portfolio doesn't really speak to the job that you want, chances are it's better for you to not add it, but to later have a chance to explain it in the right context when you get the interview. When it comes to listing each jobs, there's a lot of differing advice on here, but this is the format that we recommend at Candor. Listing your uh, position followed by your company and not listing your location. So instead of putting Facebook product manager France, we would just put product manager comma Facebook and we typically bold the position. And we do this for clarity of communication. Uh, usually positions are the most important thing that a recruiter will pattern match. And typically locations are only important if you're applying for a job that is covering a certain region. So for instance, if you are someone who has experience with EMEA or with APAC and you're applying for a strategy or a product role that covers this region, it makes sense to put your previous locations. Otherwise, it's honestly quite distracting. Uh, most companies routinely will relocate people. It's uh, really not an issue. And uh, in terms of remote, if you are looking for a fully remote role, you should put that in the header of your resume. There's no need to list locations at every job. It just visually clutters it. And again, it's not necessary. You want to put four bullet points max uh, outside of your job description. So you really, really don't want to go crazier than that. I recommend even less if you can get away with it. And if you're very senior in your job, uh, you don't even want to do bullet points. We actually recommend a narrative format that avoids these bullet points entirely. Bullet points should be one line. Uh, resist the urge to make them multiple lines. Definitely resist the urge uh, to kind of go full, uh, kind of free four lines per bullet point. It's just really hard to read. And we're optimizing here for clarity. And finally, your education. This is the format that we recommend here. So in this case, you want to list your two most recent degrees. And if you're a recent graduate, those should be at the top of your resume. And if you have not graduated, those should be at the top of your resume as well. 
But if you graduated a long time ago, those should be listed at the bottom. And you want to list your formal education first. If you have any additional certifications or anything else that you've completed, you should list that separately and call that section certifications if you'd like that to be on your profile. So those are the kind of high level tips I have for you for your resume today. I hope that this has been helpful for you and it's certainly been a pleasure for me to talk to you about how to polish your resume and talk about tips that are not really out there so far. So hopefully you can take some time to look at your resumes after this and work through them. If you would like, we have a LinkedIn group. It's called the uh, Candor Career Growth Group and it is free to join, but you do have to apply for it. Uh, so if you find that on LinkedIn, you are more than welcome to apply. And we usually review a couple of hundred applications a week. Uh, so it does take one to two weeks to be approved. But when you're approved, you can post your resume in there. And everyone in the group will give you feedback, pointers. You could also see other people's resumes that have gotten them hired. Uh, you could see uh, feedback other people have received as well. So you can learn from that. It's truly been my pleasure to spend uh, 45 minutes with you today. And since we're at the top of time, I, I won't have time for questions. But I really appreciate you attending, and I hope this has been helpful for you. Have a great day.